Welcome back to the Black Hills and Eastern Railroad, everybody. Today, we're taking a look at my scratch-built Helix to Nowhere. As you guys might know, I'm building a multiple-deck HO scale model railroad. Those multiple decks with a coherent operating plan require some way to get the trains between one level and the next. I've chosen, in this case, a scratch-built Helix. Let's take a look. So a popular saying in model railroading is, if you've stolen from me once, you've probably stolen twice. And that's definitely the case with this Helix. I got most of my information, or my mentor on this project, although I don't, I've never met him, is Jeff Johnston. He published an article in the 2008, April 2008 Model Railroader on how he built his Helix for his model railroad. I had my own set of requirements for this Helix which included more modern freight cars and full-length passenger cars. So the dimensions and math and engineering had to change from what he did. So I'll walk you through what I did here on my Helix. We'll get into the specific math and uh, engineering later on in this video, but first we want to take a deep dive into the construction of the Helix and show you some, some of the details maybe that, that Jeff left out in his article and his YouTube videos. So I must apologize that I do not have um, video here of this build. Uh, you guys will have to settle for a slideshow. Um, and there's sort of uh, the four distinct phases of the build that I wanted to discuss. Um, and the first being planning. Um, here we're taking a measurement of some of the, uh, uh, the freight cars that I'm going to run over the Helix. Uh, different types of cars that I have. Of course, uh, passenger cars, I think they're standardized at about 85 feet. Could vary plus or minus uh, by several feet here and there. And then, of course, these... 89 foot flat cars, uh, both uh, for topsy service, general service, and auto racks. Um, and what that gets us into, and I'll, I'll get into the math of this thing later, but um, what that, what you want to do there with a radius is uh, roughly three times your longest car. So uh, that gives us 36 inch radius ish. Uh, so that's what I settled on. Anyway, so we've got about two and a quarter, two and three quarters inches off the uh, top of the subroad bed. Uh, using Atlas Code 100 track to the top of an auto rack, uh, three inches to the top of the top container on a double stack. That's again using uh, Atlas Code 100 flex track. Then um, on May, May 25th, 2020, I'll give you a little history here. We laid the keel, so to speak, of this Helix build. So here's the uh, bench work getting started. Um, I figured I needed sort of a tic-tac-toe pattern um, where a lettuce standing, sassy standing there is, is going to end up being the pit of the helix, and then those arms out will support the actual uh, turns going up. And there's sassy and Ada and an animal helping out. And all three of the crew here. You notice there by Milo's left knee is that corner brace that was very handy in keeping things square as we move through bench work. And I'm still using those when I build bench work. I haven't done much of that lately, but um, it sure is handy. Uh, so go ahead and pick one of those up if you haven't already, if you're uh, figuring on building much bench work. Um, this is a one by four construction that I'm using on this Helix uh, or this Helix bench work. And then you see the overall view and, and I didn't actually put legs under this until a little while after the build. Um, and why I have all those cross members in there is basically to support the risers of the turns as we go around the helix. Um, I needed a place to mount those and that, those lent both support to the structure and a place to uh, screw in and, and attach risers so that the, uh, uh, the plywood subroad bed uh, could go around the bench work. And you again see the uh, the pit there, and I put a cross member in there. I'll discuss that here after a bit, uh, so that there's a cross member right there at the bottom of the drywall going um, horizontally across your screen. I'll discuss that here after a bit. There is that cross member again, and I'm going to remove that uh, and later on in the construction. But what, why I put that in there? Uh, that one by two that's attached to that is actually attached. And uh, the purpose of that is to maintain the center line around the, uh, the first riser and or around the first turn, and I think the second and third turn, I use that to sort of determine that the uh, center line was keeping um, on par with uh, where I needed to be with that 36 inch radius all the way around the helix. So 
um, keeping the thing in a true circle was the idea there. Um, by the way, I used, I ended up using um, two by two legs, uh, four two by two legs, and you can kind of see down there in the lower left hand corner that they're gusseted, so for strength, and they're they're plenty strong. That the uh, the helix structure um, is uh, does not wobble around, and and for added strength, I ended up going ahead and attaching uh, one of those uh, one of the sides to the existing stud wall. You can see that there in the uh, sort of the top left of the picture. Then I made myself a trammel to cut or to guide the cuts on the plywood. I used half inch birch plywood and I did not want to have any waste or any more waste than I was already knew I was going to have. So what I did is I have this board that's kind of heavy that I attached it to and then the pivot point over there on the right side of the picture and then several holes drilled to indicate the distance out from that pivot point uh, for the radius of the curve. So what I did, I think where that pencil is, is marking, I believe that's 36 inches there, or maybe a little further, that's actually, I'm sorry, that's the, uh, is that 30, that'd be 38 and a half inches, and then the next one in is 36 inches, and then the one after that would be probably um, 33 and a half inches to give us the inside of the sub road bed that we're cutting out of that half inch uh, birch plywood. So I just used a couple of pencils and moved that around and gave me a true line for a circle and gave me my center line on the sub road bed as I was cutting. Then you see here we get started actually at uh, forming up the first curve and I used a lot of clamps in a lot of situations here uh, to uh, get the thing in place before I tacked it down permanently to make sure that we were going to have a perfect circle and we're going to have uh, more or less an even grade as we go up around that first uh, turn on the helix. Again, clamps. Um, you can kind of see in the uh, lower left-hand corner here, maybe I'll, we'll have another picture that's a little better. Um, the risers that I used, I used quarter-inch plywood with a little one-by-two attached to them with uh, wood glue. And then I... Uh, I uh, countersank screws. In fact, there's one there on the bottom uh, center of the screen here that I don't have attached to anything. Uh, and I guess I did screw those in as well. So I glued and screwed them probably using, I'm guessing like one inch uh, drywall screws or something like that. And of course, I um, I, uh, I drilled pilot holes and countersank all these holes. Uh, with such small dimensional lumber, you run a huge risk of uh, of splitting the lumber as you're drilling any size screw through it. So that, uh, that was a big help in that regard. So again, we're uh, making sure that uh, that uh, plywood is, is correct as it gets higher. And I kind of did kind of did a little bit by guess by golly, uh, doing some measurements around uh, those risers um, as I'm putting it. Um, we're kind of a various sizes, of course, as you go around, you execute that first turn. Further into the turn, the risers had to get a little taller. Some of them are mounted a little further down on the bench work, but for the most part, they, they do get taller. I thought I had a system going uh, to begin with of, of all the risers in order, and it ended up not working out quite that way, uh, but we ended up with a good result anyway. Um, here is the piece of uh, sub road bed coming into the helix. And then you can see we're a little further along with marking um, up the, that gentle first grade, no track yet. And um, being very careful. Um, and, then, and then here is where you see that I ended up attaching a, uh, a two by four to raise that, uh, uh, that radius up a little bit. Uh, to determine, um, to make sure that that uh, uh, we're on the center line around the second turn. Here again, clamping, we're about ready to screw those risers in. And we finally laid track here. So I laid Atlas Code 100 track on the, uh, the entire helix. And uh, really for no other reason than it's cheaper than, uh, than any other form and really, really not going to present um, scenery on the helix. So 
uh, what's it matter anyway? So we'll go for uh, the cost saving option. I soldered all my joints. Uh, you see the solder iron there in the uh, lower right hand corner. I attached the track using, uh, I think it's number four pan head screws with a little washer underneath. Uh, that length of flexibility of being able to move that track as we're going up. Uh, in general, it's easy to line the track up with a center line, but there's some, sometimes some small adjustments needed. And uh, those uh, pan head screws uh, lent to, uh, and, the, and the washer lent to, uh, to that very well. Here's Milo and I playing around posing for a picture. I think this is shortly after we laid the last piece of track. You'll see here that um, I guess uh, in that last piece of sub road bed, um, right to my right there, there's a joint. And what I did is I used um, one by four uh, scrap uh, lumber used off of another project for my for my risers from, from one level to the other. And where it was time for a joint, um, I did basically the same thing as uh, Jeff Johnston did. I didn't um, join my level pieces of uh, plywood together at all, in other than um, other than just splicing them over the top of one of these one by fours. Um, so you can see that uh, I, I glued just like Jeff did, and then um, I I drilled pilot hole and countersank at the same step, and then uh, drilled uh, four screws down into each one of those or yeah, each one of those pieces of plywood. So uh, two screws on on each side, either side, on both sides of that joint. Nice strong joint. Um, never noticed any movement or anything on this helix at all. The way I did that was this countersink bit, um, countersink and pilot hole bit that I found. I knew they existed. I'm not sure if I learned that from Jeff or not, but um, I knew they existed and I asked a local hardware store from them and I got kind of a weird look and I ended up finding this, um, this bit actually in a set of bits at Home Depot of all places. Um, they had quite a few different things there and man, this has been uh, a time saver. I, I love this little bit. I, I hope I never lose it or break it or anything, but if I do, I'm gonna trundle back off to Home Depot and, and get another one right away. And here we're at the top of the helix. Um, I, a weak attempt at humor here, Deadwood or bust. Um, downtown Deadwood will be just off the end of the helix here. For those of you who are interested, this segment on my layout specifically re represents a little piece of railroad that doesn't exist anymore. This was CNW's line from Whitewood, South Dakota up to Deadwood, South Dakota. I kind of refer to this as the back door into, into Deadwood, South Dakota, because this uh, really is the rest, lesser recognized line. The uh, most famous line, of course, is the uh, CBNQ's line uh, from Edgemont, South Dakota, up to Deadwood, South Dakota. The CNW had a line up there too, but they came in from the, the north and the east instead of the south. A little bit of trivia about the CNW line. This is the uh, right of way that uh, Kevin Costner had planned to uh, run passenger trains over to service his Dunbar Resort from the airport down at. Rapid City, South Dakota. Too bad Mr. Costner's plans never succeeded. It had been fun to see that line revitalized and put back into use since going dormant in the early 1960s. There's no evidence that suggests CB and Q or BN trains ever use that CNW line, but it's fun to imagine and hey, it's my railroad. Anyway, on this railroad, I'm going to be modeling this as a DM&E. Uh, after their takeover, basically the colony line in the very early 1990s. And we're going to assume that uh, the CNW line su survived up to that point is being served by the Dakota, Minnesota and Eastern Railroad now in the setting of this model railroad. So when I was talking about the, uh, the math and the planning phase here, I wanted to run you through uh, a little bit of my calculations and uh, you can uh, plug your numbers in here as uh, as your requirements uh, dictate. So I told you I ended up at 36 inches because of the 12-ish uh, inch uh, freight cars, uh, obviously times three to get to uh, 36 inches, times two to get to your diameter, times pi 3.1416, gives you a circumference of 226.2. Uh, that's to the center line of the track in the, uh, in the helix. And then I told you I determined that we we're at three, three point uh, five or three and a half inches 
clearance needed, um, but you forget that there's a piece of plywood involved there too. So we actually have a rise of uh, four inches or an effective rise of four inches. So you put rise over run and you end up with about 1.76% um, grade um, over one turn. Uh, that seems manageable to me. A lot of people say uh, no more than like two and a half. And that really depends on your, your scale, your uh, uh, what type of equipment you're running over, how long of equipment, how long it trains your mileage may vary. Um, this is what uh, what I determined to be right for me based on the the, uh, the room that I have here and the, the, the space that I'm willing to grant to this Helix and uh, my individual requirements with the, the uh, cars I'll be, traffic I'll be running over it. I've been lovingly referring to this as my Helix to nowhere, primarily because there's no bench work beyond the Helix here. Uh, over my right shoulder would be downtown Deadwood, South Dakota, but I don't even have the bench work built, so um, basically the Helix goes nowhere. This was really the first piece of bench work and uh, track that I laid in this entire layout. And I did that because primarily I knew that this would be the most complicated and most difficult piece of, uh, of engineering to do. And I wanted to design primarily everything around it, not because it, it plays that important of a role in the operation scheme, but because it, uh, I needed everything to line up to it as far as the, uh, the engineering for the surrounding bench work. You can see here in the foreground on these two lower levels, I've got track outside. Um, the lower level here services the uh, line or is the line from Sioux Falls, Northern Sioux Falls through the industrial area up to West Junction and then splitting off the DNI Railroad, former Milwaukee track to Del Rapids, South Dakota and the uh, Burlington Northern Madison subdivision, uh, which also comes off that same piece of track right north of the airport there. This track here represents the CB&Q connection through Nebraska from southern Sioux City out to Edgemont, South Dakota, and places west, and of course the High Line to Deadwood, South Dakota. On this top level here, obviously the Helix comes out in Deadwood, uh, downtown Deadwood. I intend to have a loop track or a balloon track around the outside of this Helix here to turn passenger trains and other trains that will need to go uh, the other way on the High Line back towards Edgemont from Deadwood, South Dakota. I hope you enjoyed the content here. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe for more, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one.